those are integrable singularities. So you actually get a finite number. But these are true infinity because when you sum this thing up, you actually get an infinity. If you sum this thing up, you actually get an infinity. Okay? So it has no physical meaning, but there's a difference of physical meaning. That's what we're asking ourselves. Okay? And this is usually called the renormalization method. But my my philosophy is that we shouldn't by right sum to infinity anyhow. Because there's no infinitely small wavelength, infinitely large wave numbers in this world. This is an artifact of the idealization we have of the world. Okay? But let's see how this is done and actually we can truncate this to an upper limit. And then you find that the final answer, the final answer actually doesn't match up. <coughs> doesn't depend on the truncation of the upper limit. So, let's look at this difference, the difference of the, the difference of that thing. And if you write out the difference, uh, which I wouldn't write out again, it's just actually the difference of these two formulas. But um, what I can do is actually to express these integrations in cylindrical coordinate system. Okay, in uh, cylindrical coordinate system. Because dkx, dky is integration over the kx, ky plane. Okay, I can actually convert it to an integration over a kind of uh, integration over a cylindrical coordinate system. Ada and some angle plane. But this thing is actually angle independent. It is independent of the angle and the phi integration, the angular integration is just too high. And then followed by the other integration. So if we do that, then this dkx, dky integration is actually over a quadrant. You will notice that this is over a quadrant. Okay? It's the same as this integration from 0 to infinity times pi over 4. Uh, is it pi over 4, pi over 2, right? Times pi over 2. Okay, over a quadrant is like pi over 2. So what you should do then is that if you write this difference in cylindrical coordinate, you get this QD, which is E0D minus E0 infinity. And then because of the pi over 2 quadrant that we're integrating over, we get this pi over 2. And then there's an H pi C like we did before. And then L over pi squared, like we had before over there. And then we write the difference in the rates that we have over here. And then I'm writing things in cylindrical coordinate system now. Eta squared plus P pi over D squared. So what happens here is that uh, this thing just becomes Eta squared. Okay, Kx squared plus Ky squared is Eta squared. And then the Kx, the Ky, the Kx, the Ky, becomes eta the eta times pi over 2, okay, which is what I have done here. Okay, so that becomes eta the eta over here. This is the first term. The second term becomes b over pi. b over pi comes about because we take the a <coughs> z integration and convert into an integral as well. And then you have this the zeta prime, the zeta prime, zero to infinity, the eta, eta, eta squared plus to c squared, no, not to c squared, zeta prime squared, and half. Okay? So we have to subtract these two infinities. And at this point, it will be better if you do a change of variables, because this eta squared always occur together with this p pi over d anyhow, 
So we do a change of variable and call a the square to be pi over d squared doubling. Okay? So that all of them share a pi squared over d squared. And then zeta prime equals to zeta pi over d. Okay, so if I change a the square to that, and then change zeta prime to zeta times pi over d, then the pi over d can be taken out. And then finally what I have then is that um, I have this pi over 4, h bar c, l over pi square, and then um, pi over d cubed, okay, because I have a pi over d square coming out from that thing, and then I have pi over d from somewhere else. Um, and then p is to the zero to infinity prime. This prime means that the first term has to be divided by two, since it doesn't have a cousin, it doesn't have a pair. And then this integration over here just becomes w, dw, w plus p squared pi. Okay. I have done the change of variable. So eta d eta, eta d eta becomes pi over d squared d w. Okay. So I get pi over d squared, and then there's another pi over d from this factor, so I get pi over d cubed altogether. Okay, and then subtracting by another infinity. The zeta, zero to infinity, dw, w plus zeta squared half. So these two infinities to subtract from each other. Um, let me see if I can account for all the factors. Uh, actually, there's a 2 here. 2 eta d eta is equal to pi over 2. That's why this becomes pi over 4, right? Is that right? Yeah, I think that's why I have a pi over 4 instead of pi over 2 over there. Okay, so if you do all these change of variables, you will have all these things. Okay? But these are divergent integrals. These are divergent integrals. So why don't I assume that these wave numbers cannot be infinitely large. I can only integrate up to a certain radius out here. And beyond that radius, it becomes unphysical. It becomes not possible to have wave numbers that are that large, or wavelengths that are that small. So I can put an m here, and I can have an m here to convert the divergent integrals into something finite. I can let m be as large as I want later on, okay? And then uh, define two integration, okay? Define two things. Let me see. Um, And if I write this out and call this f of u, or f of, uh, let me see, p, and then m, I call this f of p and m, okay? Then what I have here is actually um, summation of the first term I should put a half. So f of 0, m, plus summation of p equal to 1 to infinity f of p, m. Okay. So that is that sum. That sum is equal to that. The first one can be written. The first one is half because the first term has no pair. It doesn't have a cousin brother. So you have to put a half there. And then the second one can be thought of as 0 to infinity d zeta, and then I can call this f zeta m, m being the upper limit of the truncation. Okay, so I can write this as such.
So, the thing about this is that if you look at these two things, um, this thing can be thought of as an approximation of this thing. That is, if you were to take this integral, okay, and approximate with a discrete summation using a very simple bar integration rule. A very simple bar integration rule, that is, if you have an integration that goes from 0 to infinity, you just replace it with a bar integration rule. A very cool integration rule. OK, you get this approximation. So this is an approximation of that. Because this thing is an approximation of that. Uh, in the past, there were no big computers, so people worked very hard to find out what the error is between this kind of thing. In the past, when people actually have to use hand calculators to calculate things. So this kind of approximations are very important. So there is a formula called the euler mclaren formula. Euler was at 18, uh, what, 1600s, 1700s? I don't know when he lived. He lived in the age when there were no calculators. Okay? at late in the 1700s. So there's a Euler, let me get the name correct, McLaurin. So this kind of uh, quadrature approximation, okay? So if you were to do this kind of approximations of the integral, Euler McLaurin, uh, McLaurin says this, that is equal to <coughs> half f of 0 m minus 1 over 12 f prime of 0 m and then uh, plus 1 over 720 f triple prime of 0 m okay? plus more and more terms which means that they actually could figure out what the errors are if you were to do this kind of approximation. And if you want a, a very useful old book, I actually found this formula in this very old book. Now all of this should have a copy of. It's at Bermovics and Stegen. Okay? And, uh, H16, uh, formula 3.6.28. Okay, they have the Euler, Euler McLaurin summation formula where they're up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, fifth terms. Okay, so you can work out that kind of thing. And Euler and McLaurin, I don't know what year that McLaurin lived, but Euler must have lived a long time ago. So they figure out this kind of approximate formula. So, but uh, f is just this thing over here. f is a function that looks something like that, and you can work that out actually. Um, you can work this thing out in close form. And all of you know how to integrate this, right? I might have forgotten how to integrate this, but it's still young enough to remember how to integrate this. Right? You know, right? You always know. So all of you know how to integrate this. So let me tell you the answer. Okay, this integrates to 2 store n plus zeta square, 3 half minus 2 third zeta square. Okay? <coughs> you integrate this, you get 3 half and then you divide by 3 half, you get 2 over 3, and then you divide it at 2 limit, upper limit, and lower limit. You get this. Okay? And then you need to find this. 
two in order to use this formula. And then it turns out that you can also evaluate those. Okay? Evaluate this as well. You just differentiate it. Two n plus zeta squared half zeta minus two zeta squared. Okay, you can keep differentiating, assuming n to be a finite number, and you can find a second derivative, and then the third derivative. Okay, I wouldn't go and do this, but then it's just a straightforward algebra. You can find all these things because you have this enclosed form. And then you find that uh, very strangely, this formula does not have the need for second derivatives. So you can actually, after you have obtained this, you can find, figure out what uh, f prime of 0 n is, is equal to 0. And then you can have f double prime of 0 n is, is equal to 2 n half and triple prime of 0 m is, is equal to minus 4. Okay, that's good enough to use this formula now. And then the first term, the first term actually cancels with this term. Cancels with this term. Okay, the first term cancels with this term. They should cancel. Let me see. Um, so this should be a minus sign over here, I'm sorry. This should be a minus sign. I think it's sign. Huh? You can have t goes to zero and the minus one. So this thing is because this one is going to come zero. I, I remember that this term cancels with some term from inside here. Oh, I mean, you can, you can add the summation. Zero to the minus oh, that's right. You're right. I can change this. Yeah, your way is it's very clever to notice that. I could have just written this from this, and then get the minus half over here. Okay, then exactly this term will cancel that term over there. Okay? And then the first term cancels. So I don't have to worry about this term. I can let it be 0, I get some finite value, and then as n goes to infinity, they always cancel each other. I can let the limit of n go to infinity later on. And it turns out that this formula does not depend on the second derivative. So I can let n go to infinity, it does not affect my final answer. The third term does not depend on m at all. Okay, so I can let n go to infinity after I do the cancellation and the summation, and end up with this difference in the energy. Difference in the energy actually gives me something that uh, if I plug in things correctly, I get U of T, which is the difference of this energy, is equal to pi square h bar c over 4 t cubed L cubed minus 4 over 7 to 20. Okay, and this derivation is attributed to Miloni and Xi. Let me give them the proper credit. Okay, Miloni and Xi. Okay, so this is the Hasmian energy for a certain separation D, which can be pi square h bar C over 720 dq L square. And then you take the derivative of this with respect to to d to get the force. Okay, then you get this cosmic force being equal to that. 240 d to the power of 4. Okay? So this is a small force because there's an h bar in the numerator, there's also a big C there. I don't really know these numbers, but it doesn't come into importance unless D becomes very small. 
<coughs> the problem is that, and it is estimated that when B is on the order of nanometers, this force per unit area, actually this is the force per unit area because we actually divide out the area. This is the force, or this is the pressure. Force per unit area of pressure is about one atmosphere. It could be as large as one atmosphere or, or on the order of magnitude. So it is an important force for nanotechnology to consider. Okay. If you say in this thing that I talked out of Jerry and Knight that this force was confirmed in 1957 by spawning, but I think the real person to really confirm it is actually Lamoro. He did some very nice experiments to confirm the existence of this force. Okay? So, so this is much I have to say about cosmic force. Or oh, maybe I can talk about something else. Okay, another way of calculating this cosmic force is to use the energy method, but you know that finding the modes of a complex structure is very important. If I have two objects here, how do I find the modes of this structure? It's a very important problem. I know how to find the modes of a structure like parallel place. That is a textbook problem for undergraduate courses. But in general, how do you find the mode of a complex structure? And if you have a way of finding the modes of the complex structure, how do you calculate the total energy of the system? So let me go through that procedure of finding the energy uh, using a method called the argument principle approach. Okay. Are there any questions regarding this parallel plate example? If, yeah? How do we get from L2 to L2? Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Huh? Did I make a mistake somewhere? Let me check. I take this out of several lecture books. Yeah. I took it out of Jerry and Mike. He has an L fifty L square too with that. Okay. Maybe it's a printing error, right? Mm -hmm. Let me check how it works. Yeah, I think up to this stage we have L squared. Okay, suddenly it becomes L cube. I took this out of uh, Gary and Mike's book, so maybe it has a typo. Okay, because it's L squared over here. Okay, then it's L cube over here. So maybe it's the same. Because the dimension won't be the same. It yeah. should be Q. And not being two. Yeah. L and, uh, squared. Right, L squared, right? Yeah, yeah. because it won't be energy otherwise. Right. It's L squared up to there. I just took it out of this. Yeah, so no, this is in the Okay. So, I have to Let's talk about how we can find these modes. And if we have a method of finding these modes of a complex structures, how can we use that to find the total energy, the cosmic energy of the system? Okay? Let's talk about this. And that recently has been used by one of my PhD students, Phil Atkins, to calculate cosmic force, which is the argument principle. Approach. Actually, the argument principle approach is a rather neat approach. And that if we have the desire to sum over modes, say if we have to find the cosmic energy which is sum over all the modes of the system, okay, some people just write this system like this. And then, if you want to write this sum in a neat way, say if you have, this is usually written also as this. Okay, if you need to find this sum, we need to calculate omega j. And if you know 
of a numerical method to find omega j. How, we can, how can we write this sum in a neat fashion? It turns out that there is an argument principle that says that this is actually a very neat formula, I find. That if you were to perform this integration over a contour C, okay, a contour C, then this actually equals the sum of the zeros and the poles of this function, okay, in that enclosed contour C. Say you have poles, zeros, and poles that this contour encloses. Okay, usually we use zero to denote zeros, right? Cross to denote poles, right? Okay, and so this is what we do in other courses as well. Then the argument principle says that this is equal to <coughs> phi omega zero i minus sum of phi omega infinity j. Okay, these are the locations of the zero, zero location of f of omega. These are the co-location of f of omega. So this is a rather neat formula. So if I can get the right hand side to look like that, I can get the right hand side to look like that, then I have a very neat way of performing this sum by doing a Cauchy integration. I just need to find a function which perform this integration, and then I can find the total energy by just doing numerical integration. Okay. But let me prove this formula first. I find this formula to be quite neat, and perhaps not only useful for cosmic energy calculation, but could be used for a lot of other things. <coughs> So, if you look at this thing, what it says is that this integral, let me call this i, okay? This integral i is equal to p of omega over a contour. And then if I take the derivative of this is f prime of omega, f of omega, p omega, right? Okay? And then uh, at the poles and zeros location, this thing always goes to infinity. Agree? If I have a zero, log of zero is infinity, this thing goes to infinity. If I have a pole, log of infinity is infinity, this thing goes to infinity. So I should be able to show that at the poles and zeros location of this thing, both of this factor, this factor always goes to infinity. How do I show that? If I have a zero location, f of omega is approximately equal to a omega minus omega zero when omega tends to omega zero. If omega zero is a pole of uh, a zero location, that is true. Okay, then f prime of omega would be just a constant when omega tends to omega zero. Then you see that f omega is equal to 1 over omega minus omega naught, and omega tends to omega naught. So if I have a zero, okay, what it means is that I can show that this integration is reducible to integration of the residual integration around this poles and zeros, because the poles and zeros become infinity. I have to account for those pose and zero location method. So using Cauchy's integration theorem, I can write my integration around the singularities. Does everybody know what Cauchy's integration theorem is? You know, right? Everybody knows. And all of you have had a course in complex variables, I suppose. Right? But if not, then you have had this exposure in uh, some signal processing course on your Z transform, Laplace transform, Fourier transforms. Okay? 
So integration around a complex contour is equal to integration around the singularities that this contour encloses. And this is called Cauchy's theorem. Or Cauchy's integration theorem, Cauchy's residue theorem. So if this is the case, then around the pole, okay, when you take the residue, this is just one over two pi i. Uh, phi of omega or around the zero this to be true okay v omega I can take this to be omega approximately equal to omega now I can bring the integration and find the residue of this thing and then this one just becomes phi of omega zero because I'm performing the contour integration only around the pole location and what does this give me if I perform so this is equal to 1 over 2 pi i p of omega 0. Okay, the residue of this thing. Okay, you remember from your complex variables theory what that thing gives you? 2 pi, two pi i, right? So it's just equal to p of omega naught. Very good. Okay. So then you come up with a theorem that if I were to perform this for every pose that I found, I get this summation for the first time. What about if that location is a pole in say? Say if, if, let me call this infinity, okay? If the function is validated near the pole location, then you can see that at prime of omega is equal to minus a omega minus omega infinity squared, right? If I differentiate it once, and then if I take this quotient, okay, I get minus, uh, let me see, what do I get? I get something like this again, right? I get something like this. Instead of something like this, I get something like this with a minus sign out front. And then I go and take the residue, I get all these terms with the minus sign contribution on the outside. So this is a rather neat theorem I call. Okay, so if you know the poles and locations, poles and zero location of the function, you can write and integrate in such a manner that you sum up all the contributions around the poles and zeros locations. So the trick is then to find something that sums to this thing. So it turns out that uh, I can find the Hausner energy, okay, to be that contour integration, and let me see. Um, they have to be something that you have to do first. Okay, let me do that little bit. Maybe I have about five minutes more. So Given this contour integration, and if I fix the contour so that if I know the pole location and the zero location of a system, I know that the pole locations have to be something like this. Okay. They have to be below the, this is the complex omega point. They have to be below the ray axis in order for the system to be stable, right? That is how we translate them. We usually like to talk about this in a fast transform, but you can also talk about this in a complex omega plane. But I'm only interested in summing over all the positive omega. So I've figured out a way of doing my control integration so that I sum over all this. So if I pick my control integration to be like that, that contour integration will pick up all the poles on the right side of the omega plane, all the positive modes that I have in the system. Okay? So if I do that, then I can show that if I pick the function such that by invoking Jordan's lemma, the contribution from this part is zero. Okay. You can take the function in such a way that um, 
the contribution from that part is equal to zero. Sorry, that should be thing of f of omega. Okay, that the contribution from that part is zero, and then I can replace this integration with just an integration on the imaginary axis. And then I will have omega, d omega, plane of f of omega. The reason why I put omega over there <coughs> is that it will give me the h bar omega j that I'm looking for. Because I want the linear function of omega. I want something that looks like that. So I put omega over there. And then I can do a change of variables. Okay, I can do a change of variables called the Wick's rotation. And so that integration along the imaginary axis is the same as integration along the ray axis. So this is ICK uh, is equal to I omega kind of thing. Okay, do a change of variables such as this one over here, I think that's right, kappa, kappa. No, I don't need that. Omega equal to ICK kind of change of variables, then what I have then is that this integration becomes a real integration in terms of kappa or K. The, the omega becomes the I the kappa thing of f i c kappa okay i c g kappa okay 